Okay, we're going to try to record another podcast today. I was putting out a shorter version yesterday of one of the stories. And um, unfortunately, because I was using my headphones, a large part of it was not audible. So here goes again, but it's going to be a broader one. We're going to talk about the uh, political races from yesterday and the primaries and also the issue that I call the reverse Colin Kaepernick. Really, an example of somebody who did the exact same thing as Colin Kaepernick, but the media is not going to praise him for it because they don't really care about freedom of speech. They care about certain narratives being put forward. So we'll start with that. There's a player in France for the one of the larger clubs in its uh, soccer league. His name is Idrissa Gueye, and he plays for the club Paris Saint-Germain. And he was told to wear a, a kit, okay, that's what they call the uniform over in Europe in terms of what soccer players wear. He was told to wear a kit that included the gay pride colors and was a statement against um, homophobia and transphobia on the International Day of, uh, I think it's the International Day of Remembrance for tra- for homophobia and transphobia. I don't, I don't know the name of it because I don't think ever, anybody had ever heard of the holiday before this year. Uh, in any case, he refused. The reason he refused was because uh, from what I saw in the Daily Mail because of his religion. Uh, He's Muslim. He happens to be from uh, either Cameroon or uh, Senegal or one of the other former French colonies in Africa. And he took a stand and he said, yeah, I'm not going to play if you force me to wear this kit. And his coach or manager, I think they call it in soccer, his coach uh, decided, okay, we're not going to have you in the game. It's not really... And and he probably doesn't really care that much I, anyway, the coach. Um, so, why do I call this the reverse Colin Kaepernick? Because, unlike with Colin Kaepernick, who took a stand against the American... Uh, the, the American nation, really, and, and basically branded American police and the American justice system as racist and discriminatory... He, Mr. Gueye, he, he is not going to get all of the praise and adulation that one would expect from a person who um, took a stand the way that Colin Kaepernick did, because it's the wrong cause. Why is it the wrong cause? Well, many people who are, uh, you know, hooked up into the progressive mindset, they don't understand that Islam is a religion that is very restrictive and judgmental about sexual behavior. So they seem to think that they can support causes like the Palestinian cause, like the refugees coming into Europe from certain Muslim states, without encountering the contradiction between that and their own stated stances on homosexuality, and uh, gender identity and things like that. The reality is this. You, you can either have uh, one set of beliefs or another. You can't, you can't take a doctrinal belief system set in the, you know, the early Middle Ages, really. That's when Islam originated, if not in the Dark Ages of, of human history. Uh, that's no judgment on their part. It's just that's the period when it came from. Islam came from the 7th century, and, uh, you know, a lot of resistance has been made towards attempts to change it, right? The, you know, there's very little movement to reform the beliefs of Islam. So you can't take a belief system like that and try to reconcile it with extremely modernist and postmodernist attitudes towards homosexuality. And, and a lot of people who are in the progressive space, they'll try to point towards, you know, examples of, um, you know, tolerance, like the Islamic golden age, 
in the Basset Cow outfit and things like that. No, the, the, the reason that this is not going to work is because they are cherry picking the, the parts of Islam that are acceptable to them as progressives. They don't, most of these people have no belief in any sort of um, divine being. They don't really have any attachment to uh, a, a greater moral code than their own. Right, um, many of them are, are simply atheists, if, if not in in name, than they are in terms of their lifestyle. Okay, they they don't attend attend either church or mosque or synagogue regularly, or or for that matter, you know, they may be very very loosely into one of the other Eastern religions. Right, a lot of these posers who say that they're Buddhist because they go to a certain like yoga class or something. It's, it's a very superficial mindset, and they disrespect people's actual cultural heritage when they try to make it all about tolerance, and we accept, we accept all of these categories, meaning the sexual minorities, and then we also re- accept all of these other categories, which are religious and racial minorities. Well, in many cases, those two categories don't mix because the cultural... Um, the cultural belief system, the traditional belief system within those communities is inherently against it. So I think that what Idrissa Gueye is doing is, is the reverse of Colin Kaepernick. And let me put, put, put into context some other issues that I think are inherent to this discussion, okay? What, what did Colin Kaepernick uh, end up taking a stand against? He took a stand against... Uh, standing for the national anthem, so he basically kneeled instead of taking a stand, and he classified that as compelled speech that was forcing him to support a system that he believed is is, um, discriminatory and prejudicial against people like him, against the black community. Well, what is Idrissa Gueye doing? He's, He's doing the same thing, and it's even more explicit compelled speech. And the debates that we're going to be seeing, which are not going to happen in the case of Gue, but the, the, if, if you actually put these two things side by side, I think you could argue that Gue has a much stronger case than Colin Kaepernick. It's always been in the contracts of many of these players that they should uh, stand for the national anthem here in the U.S. I know, I know in, the, in the NBA and the NFL, it was always an item in the contract uh, that the players' associations would sign with the league. And at times there have been little cutouts for players who have political or religious beliefs. There was, um, there was a player in the, in the 90s, I think, a Sharif Abdul Rahim, who got a cutout, and, and eventually the league said, yeah, you don't have to stand for the national anthem. He was a member of the Nation of Islam. So... <laughs> Those of you that are, are thinking, oh, we're going, this, is, this has nothing to do one with another. One of them is a bigot, the other is standing up against injustice. It has everything to do with it. Um, if Kaepernick wants to say staying, standing for the national anthem is freedom of speech and, and it's his right to stand up against compelled speech because he says the national anthem uh, and, and standing for it is compelled speech, then the same thing goes for Idrissa Gue. Well, the obvious difference, okay, and I haven't missed this, is that Gue plays in France. They don't have the First Amendment there. And that's what I think is so important, that in the U.S., you do have First Amendment protections in many cases. In France, not necessarily. So we'll have to see what happens to Mr. Gue. But if, if there is some sort of action taken against him where they basically say, you're going to have to forfeit part of your salary or you're going to be suspended for homophobia or something. There's not going to be a single pundit from ESPN or from Sports Illustrated or from any of the other, or Deadspin for, for, for that matter. Any of the big sports pundits, none of them are going to stand up for his right, his religious right, by the way, to object to having to wear something that is basically contradicting his religion. They're, they're, probably going to ignore the issue because they don't want to confront the reality of what Muslim um, doctrines say about homosexuality, which is that it is 
forbidden. It is haram, as they would say. Um, so we're going to not really hear that much about that, but I will talk about it. And I do call Idrissa Gueye the reverse Kaepernick. Um, the other topic we're going to talk about today, I'm not going to go too far in depth. I happen to be commuting right now, but we have uh, several races that went down yesterday in North Carolina, Pennsylvania, and a few other states. I know Idaho and Kentucky decided to, uh, or they had their primaries yesterday. And I think that those primaries are very revelatory as to where America is politically right now. First of all, um, centrist candidates on the Democratic side, um, they're not exactly able to point towards big successes. Now, there was a race in South in uh, North Carolina. I forget which district, but it's the one that includes the Raleigh-Durham area, the, the what, what's called usually the Triangle. Um, that area, there was a progressive who was fended off, and her name was Nita Alam, and there was a lot of concern that she would get the nod and she would basically be a shoe-in to enter Congress because it's one of the most most blue districts in North Carolina. So Nita Alam did come close in terms of uh, running a can- you know running in a very large field and making a respectable um, a, res- a, respe- a respectable result. I think she got thirty six percent. The eventual winner got, I think, 43%. And then there were a few also-rans, including Clay Aiken, by the way. Clay Aiken got 7%. Um, So you do have one race where the progressives uh, flopped, but not by much. And then there's another race in Pittsburgh where you have a progressive candidate named Sonny Lee, who was running against a more centrist one named Steve Irwin. Uh, no relation to Crocodile Hunter. Uh, anyway, so, <laughs> to, not to my knowledge at least. So in that in that race at the moment, as far as I know, uh, Summer Lee is winning. Okay, it's a, de- it's a dead heat. And there's probably going to be a, re- uh, uh, what do you call it, a recount. And I would not be surprised if in the recount, either of the candidates, um, you know, they explore legal maneuvers. But this was a race that a lot of the more centrist Democrats were pumping many, many funds into in order to hold off the progressive creep of the Democratic Party. And they they may well have succeeded, but it shows just how much they have to try in order to keep somebody who has, um, you know, more radical ideas from getting into Congress. And, And in this case, this is a Pittsburgh area congressional race. This would have been uh, yet another addition to the squad, just like the one in North Carolina. So a lot of people on the Democratic side, they're hesitant to get those people in because you're seeing right now a huge crack up on the left. Okay, there's people who were willing to go along with the Democratic Party for many, many years on the understanding that while they would push progressive ideology, generally they... the the people who support the Democratic Party would be able to get away with business as usual. So you had tech billionaires like Mark Zuckerberg, Jeff Bezos, uh, basically entering into a Faustian bargain with the Democratic Party, depending on who you think is the devil. Some people would say it's Jeff Bezos. Some people would say it's the Democrats. But, you know, it's (laughs) it's all in the eye of the beholder. Um, But both of them would essentially cooperate on various issues because, you know, there's there's a lot of overlap in terms of interests. The, Dem- the Democrats are not actually the party of unions and working class anymore. Uh, in fact, I would say that if you want to talk about union support for the Democratic Party, the crucial unions are state employees. And in terms of unions that are in the private sector, such as, as uh, building trades, and machinists and things like that and and, uh, electricians, they're sort of losing a lot of the audience because what are you going to do? A lot of these policies, especially with regards to trade and imports, the Democrats are way out of step with the average, uh, you know, union wage worker, right? And and even non-union workers. 
Um, I really encountered this when I was working at my previous job. Most of the union employees, from what I understood, seemed to loathe Joe Biden. And they, these were people who had been decades in the union. They'd been uh, machinists and, and steel workers. So you could, you could actually see that these people who Joe Biden and, and the Democratic Party claim to represent, they, they absolutely loathe him. And it's not as if this is something that I had to get out of them. Usually I wouldn't, I, I would just sit around and stay silent in the lunchroom when these people were talking. And um, really what we're seeing in terms of the Democrats and the business community, big business, is that they're also starting to alienate some of them. Uh, just this week, you had Jeff Bezos actually speak out directly against the Biden administration's monetary and economic policies and talk about how they caused inflation. The, the White House and its um, and, and the federal departments that take orders from it, such as the Treasury and to some extent the Federal Reserve and, and uh, you know, the, some of the spending priorities in Congress. And, and Jeff Bezos for many years has been a person who, while he's not uh, explicitly political, you can see that he has uh, a tendency to back candidates who are either uh, establishment Democrats or establishment Republicans. So, so people like Joe Biden. And because of the failure of the Biden economic agenda, which is now leading America into a depre either a depression or a recession, uh, Bezos knows that a lot of his fortune could be in, in jeopardy. I don't think he's going to be poor by any means, but he's going to lose some money that um, he was not planning to lose because of an economic downturn. Imports from China are not as easy to get because of supply chain issues and because of lockdowns in China and because of some of the, um, you know, some of the backlog of, of shipments. We're, we're going to see real economic hardship in the U.S. this summer and, and fall and, and probably going on for a while that we haven't seen in over a generation, if not more. Uh, some people are predicting a, such a catastrophic uh you know, economic situation that it might rival the Great Depression itself. Uh, you know, I, I don't hope it, it's going to happen, but, you know, when you read some of the predictions and people, re like, looking through the data that we do have, I, I think people ought to prepare for it. And certainly, I think Jeff Bezos speaking out publicly about it, it shows that he's worried enough about the economic situation that, he thinks that this is going to actually affect him, right? And and I don't, like some people will say, well, this is just a person who is so greedy and out of touch that he can't handle losing a few dollars. That's not what we're talking about. Jeff Bezos, he's one of those people who's so wealthy and so powerful that he can probably get by without saying anything. He could certainly find ways to uh, safeguard his own fortune against the, tra the changing economic trends. So why would he be speaking out? Probably because he is concerned about areas of quality of life that may, may even affect him, right? So, yes, he could live in his closed, uh, you know, gated community and commute by helicopter. He can afford to do all of those things. That's not what he's concerned with. But if he wants to go enjoy, um, you know, certain outings with the family in, in public areas, you know, do things that, that he probably, he might enjoy, uh, that are going to be more difficult to do because of the economic situation, then I'm, I'm sure that he's going to be, um, you know, not happy if, the economic situation is so bad that it complicates that. And I'm not saying that this is going to be a monetary issue. I'm saying that he's going to have to either, you know, throw his money around much more or he's going, you know, there's certain things that people enjoy that they're not exclusive, right? Such as going to a concert or uh, going to a hockey game or whatever. And, and if people can't afford tickets... And you're a rich person up in the in, in the what do you call them the suites? Then 
is it as exciting of a of a of an experience that you're sitting there basically in an empty arena and the stadium the the arena itself is empty and it's only you because people can't afford tickets to see the game that's what i'm talking about that it's become a real hazard that many of the experiences that people are taking for granted as uh you know very casual recreational activities could become economically hard to do if you're not of a certain class and and jeff bezos is aware of that it affects his business but it probably affects his own interests and hobbies as well so um that's why bezos is probably breaking with the democrats that's why you see elon musk even more and they're they're not friends by the way so elon musk and jeff bezos are basically right now turning against the democratic party uh, in, in more explicit terms, and we're going to see uh, the ramifications of that, I think, come November, because you're going to have a failing economy, you're going to have a lot of people who are, um, you know, struggling to make ends meet, and some of those people are probably long-standing uh, Democratic voters, people who may have never voted Republican in their life, and I think that a few of them will probably cross the lines and vote for the GOP. Uh, I'm, I'm not counting on everybody. Look, I, I live in a very blue county, and I'm not going to uh, expect much of the people that I see sometimes on public forums that are, you know, spouting off and saying, you know, we need to stop Putin's party. They call that one of them calls the Republican Party the Geo Putin, right? Because they think that basically the Russian government controls the GOP. I don't expect much from them, but the average person, I think, will either stay home or, you know, possibly even cross over and vote for a GOP candidate. Um, getting back to some of the races. So the big races yesterday, North Carolina, you had the Senate race was basically called almost at the beginning in favor of Ted Budd, who was the Trump-supported candidate. You also had a race in Pennsylvania for governor that was called very early in favor of Doug Mastriano, another Donald Trump-supported candidate. So immediately you have his, um, his ledger showing two big wins. You had one of his candidates who was endorsed, Madison Cawthorn, losing his seat as an incumbent. So that, of course... Counts, <coughs> counts against Trump's record in terms of endorsements, but he didn't lose by a large margin. And you could probably say that this was a result of Cawthorn's own personal scandals, not much because of the Trump effect, but the media was really gun gunning for Madison Cawthorn for several weeks. In any case, what's happened with that is we're going, you know, North Carolina, I think, is probably going to be a sweep for the Republicans. You're going to see a lot of people turn out to vote for the Senate race and also for a couple open state Supreme Court seats. Uh, I think it's going to be a very big November for, for the Republicans in North Carolina. Uh, Pennsylvania is a little bit more murky because Mastriano is much more controversial there. You have two very large Democratic-controlled uh, metropolitan areas, Pittsburgh and, and Philadelphia, and of course you have an, an electoral system that the GOP uh, candidate, Doug Mastriano, has questioned in terms of its integrity. So I think it's, it's a big question over there. And also the Senate race really has gone down to the wire. It's not even decided at this moment. Uh, so you had a race that was uh, divided very cleanly two ways for much of the race between Dr. Mehmet Oz and uh, David McCormick, a big hedge fund executive, I think. Um, and then late in the race, there was a third candidate who really started to grow in terms of her vote share. Uh, I think her name was uh, Kathy Barnett. And the result has been that about a third of the voters went for Dr. Oz, another third went for um, for McCormick, and about 
23% went for Kate, uh, Kathy Barnett. So that's a very close race. And Trump's endorsement of Mehmet Oz might prove to have been the successful one. Now, does that make him the great, the great candidate that is going to win in the Senate race in November? I think it's way too early to say. Um, you know, sometimes you see a race that's so close and you don't really know how to predict whether the voters who voted for the other candidates are going to really get behind them. And this is this is one of them, right? A lot of people were hesitant to throw their support behind doc, Dr. Oz because a lot of his beliefs are pretty murky or, or un, up until recently they were not exactly what the average Republican voter would support, right? You had him... In one case, I did see that he supported transgender ideology among minors. Okay, that's that's something I think is very legitimate to criticize with Dr. Oz. And uh, he's also had a number of controversial issues with his show in terms of promoting uh, certain weight loss remedies and things like that. So I think we, we certainly have reason to be skeptical of his candidacy. And uh, David McCormick has clashed a little bit with uh, Donald Trump, not not really on a personal level, but it's clear that uh, President Trump wasn't keen on supporting him. And Kathy Barnett has sort of positioned herself as the really hardcore um, candidate for the Make America Great Again movement. And, and I think it was appropriate for a lot of people to support her because she seemed to be the most organic, most down-to-earth candidate. Uh, I personally, I never really looked into the race and to the degree where I would say one person is the best, right? There were people that I had reservations about, like Dr. Oz. There were people that um, I think sort of got in and they seemed to be more about the fortune that they could employ, like both Dr. Oz and McCormick. And there were people that had personal uh, issues with their record that sort of raised questions like Kathy Barnett uh, and her military record that, that is not exactly clear. But I think that overall, the races yesterday, they do show that there was a lot of power employed by the Trump um, the, the Trump, uh, what do you call it? The Trump camp <laughs> over in Mar-a-Lago. A, lo- a lot of his uh, mystique has carried over even in cases where voters are not necessarily eager to support a candidate, uh, Trump's endorsement means a lot. And, uh, you know, the, the political uh, class, the people and the political media, they don't really understand that this isn't horse race politics anymore. Uh, wh- why is it called horse race politics? Because you do have certain members of the media who behave as if this is simply a matter of polling and who is more electable and who, you know, focus groups and, and things like that. There, If you remember Chris, uh, what was his name? Uh, Frank Luntz, who for many years was the big pollster for Fox News. He was always on Sean Hannity. And he would show these graphs and these pie charts and things like that. And he would have these focus groups that would actually appear um, on camera and talk to him about what they were feeling about a certain candidate, that type of politics is starting to fade away, just like Frank Luntz is, because so many of their predictions have gone wrong, and and you can't really use focus groups the same way anymore, because voters just don't have uh, identical personal beliefs anymore. It's not as if you can have a consistently uniform belief system across one class of people anymore. So that's factoring into how unsuccessful this um, race has been for people trying to predict it. Um, and I think that as the, as the election season goes on, you're going to have some of these pundits like Steve Kornacki of MSNBC that are going to continue to get attention even though they, they're not going to be able to predict things accurately. Uh, it's not exactly their fault that they can't predict, you know, almost nobody can predict it accurately. But You know, you you had a lot of people predicting that Kathy Barnett would overcome Oz and and McCormick, and a lot of those people were on the left, and they were saying that this was a dangerous woman, and 
Proud Boys and yada, yada, yada. Nobody really knows until the votes are actually cast, which is one of the reasons that I don't like to rely on polling. Um, you know, this is one of the big flaws of the media, that they'll take opinion polling and they'll say, well, this is what we should craft policy around. This is why we need to get behind either uh, gun control or, um, you know, universal health care. Many people have used universal health care polling over the years when they ask people questions about it that ignore the aspect of how it's paid for. So those are issues that I think you, you have to look at in terms of is politics really a horse race? Is it about polling? Is it about looking at pie charts and percentages and all that? Or is it really something where you have to actually go into the areas where people are voting and see really how the tide is, is, is um, developing over there instead of just relying on data that gets spit out by, uh, you know, by telephone pollsters or people who, you know, I, I don't know exactly how all these agencies compose their polls, but it's clear that many of them have been flawed. Uh, and in Pennsylvania, that's certainly the case. That's about it. Please like, share, and subscribe. You can also subscribe to me on all the alternative media. Uh, you have Gab, Bitchu, Subscribestar, if you want to donate. Subscri- uh, Substack, Minds, um, Odyssey, Rumble, and uh, there's a few others in the description. And have a great day. I'll talk to you later.